Hi, my name is Tim Carter again, and this is uh, Texture Talk. This is part two of the fake experts or false authority, fake authorities, false experts. Um, is speaking about how the phenomenon of talk, uh, one religious group that is very noteworthy, uh, they say that their, their talk, their oral tradition to them is wine, uh, wine like the alcoholic beverage wine, and that the Bible or scripture is water. And they said if you had to choose between the text or their talk, their oral tradition, they said they would choose the wine. Well, of course, it does indicate that which is a phenomenon to those of us who study it. It's almost intoxicating for people uh, to talk and tout things. And it does become an inebriated uh, condition. If you notice the context, it becomes very emotive, irrational. People become very, uh, well, all range of emotions. They'll start off maybe uh, seemingly rational, then they'll become very outraged, and then they'll become very remorseful, and they'll go through all this range of emotion back and forth. But it'll always end with very abrupt avoidance, source avoidance, source bias. Uh, in the conclusion of the first part, I'll just read this, is that you know, a few talkers spreading pseudo-knowledge, and that's what we call knowledge that's assumed rather than learned, uh, can convince a lot of truthful believers that wrong is right, rhetoric is research, opinion is fact, and false choice is decision making. So that's where I want to pick up today uh, because, for example, we place things on this apologetic and outreach site that are based on the text, and no one counters with a text. Uh, that is, for example, if you uh, have ever talked with someone who teaches something they taught, there's a talk called baptismal regeneration. And you have to really uh, empathize with the person because they've really built everything on that. And when you talk to them and you notice that where they're, they have a text, it has baptism, but no water, or water, no baptism, or baptism with water, but no regeneration. Regeneration, but no baptism and no water. So they just can't quite find the text that matches that talk so they go over and over a vast array of bits and pieces and it's it would be what we call today a cut and paste you might say um, but if you don't empathize with the person then you really won't be able to put yourself in their place and recognize it's like this format of an apologetic and outreach website using a video it kind of gives them the privacy to at least watch it by themselves. Uh, one young man, a very brilliant person, uh, was so emotionally upset that he became irate. And he had noticed in me the inability to pretend that what he was saying might be written somewhere. And you, he noticed my inability to pretend that what he was saying, talk, might be written, became joined together with his knowledge that what he was saying wasn't written and it was like a collision that occurred between his ears and he just he had a meltdown we had to count, uh, cut short the debate that we were having and I was really I felt horrible for the young man I was literally broken emotionally because I, I could only think how devastating it must be for someone to build their entire uh, world view upon something uh, first, if we, we both agreed a Bible was in the room and a Bible would be what we used, it just didn't occur to him until he discussed with me that what he could not find written, I could not pretend might be there. Um, it was very upsetting. Uh, but now in this format, he can watch it, he can absorb a little, set it down, come back, uh, because it is a disturbing thing to try to reconcile this great disparity between the ideal world of what we say and imagine being true and then the reality that the scripts say something quite different. So he can become cynical or he can reconcile that. Uh, so let's uh, move on and how do we expose this false authority or this instant expert? Uh, well really it says uh, here I'll just uh, keep it succinct. 
A genuine authority knows what he or she is texting about, not talking about, and is prepared to document it through supportive research and or confirmed history of relevant experience and or fallacy-free logic. So, um, if you if you are someone who says you believe in the Bible, then it, in a rational world, then that's a book, it's a document. Uh, we know it has a historical language, biblical Hebrew, uh, Koine Greek. Those are dead languages, they don't change. We know that there's a King James Version, probably the most popular English one, so that you can treat it like a dead language, go back to it and just leave it there because it won't change. I think the last major change was 1796 or something. So you can pretty well, even though English is a dynamic language, that English isn't. So you can sit down with those three documents, for example, and then go through that. And if what you're asserting isn't there, which is typical because a person uh, talks first, and then goes to these texts to try to find support, which is really the opposite. Uh, in hermeneutics, we start with the text and lead out from there. Now, it's difficult to get there, especially with our biases. Uh, well, our biases, we're all biased to some extent. <clears throat> but if you really want to study the text, that's what a genuine authority will do. They'll, they'll know what they're texting about. So when we put something online here at IamCornet.org, the Outreach Ministry of Landmark Baptist Church in Jacksonville, Arkansas, we, we're just providing what the text says. That's why someone will say, well, what do you believe about this? And what they're saying is, what do you support about this particular thing? And I'll go to the text and say, well, here's what the text says. Um, and then it's almost as if they're almost always disappointed instead of um, telling the truth um, in the first place that I value what I have to say more than what's written which is back to that inebriated state of mind where I'm rather be intoxicated and imbibe my wine than drink that water of the word uh, that's just uh, the way we all are and in time we we begin to realize that yes if the Bible is the rule of faith and practice it's the source of truth then we move over and begin to support that and we're called to do that and that would be a genuine authority in any field if you don't uh, lead out from your text and your research that's rational then you're, you're really off the off offline well a false authority is a generalized fake uh, the talker does not know what he or she's talking about and thus relies on fallacious arguments to make an untrue point i've seen people prove their view of let's say the rapture based on their ability to become emotional and no one had ever forewarned me about that I was I always had very educated pastors uh, that was a gracious gift from God I always had men who let out from the text so I don't know why someone would be a verse to the Bible. The, the Bible's better than any solutions, let's say, rapturists have constructed. As wonderful as they are, you can fall for one of the biggest tricks in the world is to pick from a solution for a problem that doesn't exist in the Bible. The Bible has great information. Uh, it just bothers people because there's so much more religion. The religious market's so much larger than the people for whom and to whom the Bible was personally and directly and immediately written and for whose sake it was written. So that's difficult for people um, because um, you might want to go along with someone who's talking or touting something in hopes that maybe you could reach them. The problem is once you go along with them you'll find more often than not they never want to give up the talk and then you never want to lose that following that you've insecurely um, secured um, and then it just becomes a mess then because uh, trying to keep people based on talk will just require you to have to constantly talk and talk and talk and eventually they might just click on a computer um, and just look up anything they want to know about the Bible and in just a few moments know that what you're talking about isn't what's written and you might be very embarrassed about that. Uh, Context-specific fake. 
Uh, the instant expert is a context-specific fake. Uh, this talker also is unable to document what she or he is talking about. Again, this was written by a man who was battling the hysteria over Y2K, and he was saying no such thing is possible. It doesn't even exist in the realm of possibility in science and computer technology. But no one listened because the hysteria was too good of a market. It, even Christian groups jumped on the bandwagon to seize the money that could be harvested from the emotions of people. Uh, but it says, and thus also relies on deceitful, fallacious reasoning to persuade others to accept illogical, untrue arguments. So if you had concerns about a computer during Y2K, did you consult a computer scientist, perhaps a computer technologist, perhaps a computer technician, or did you consult the airwaves of religious rhetoric, political ploys, um, people who like to be alarmist out there? <clears throat> uh, I remember worrying about Y2K and someone said, well, I thought you knew better. And I said, well, I do. It's just the people don't. And I said that people could, in just mass hysteria, create a consequence that would require someone to uh, have to be prepared for things that would otherwise be um, abnormal. So let's move on. I don't want to be too long, but the talker's motto is know nothing, know everything. Because if you know something, you, you're left out of the conversation. No one, as I just used Y2K, no one calls the computer scientist in or goes to the computer science website to look up what the computer scientists are saying. Um, and if you study, for example, Bible languages, which my pastor, Dr. Lynn Baxter, told me I would be much farther along in the future if I just took the time to invest in those languages, took the time to learn the science of hermeneutics, took the time to become a systemic theologian, learn how to systematize and recognize the synthesis of the scriptures, which now that's difficult because it, it's the scripture scripting my brain, uh, scripting my understanding of the subject and it's me yielding to the synthesis of scripture and not being a deconstructionist but for people who know nothing why they can come up and i saw a fellow recently on a mass broadcast of mega markets and he had his flashy charts and he was uh, bellowing out and he was uh, yelling and the people were uh, clapping and one text he read said just the opposite of what he was uh, asserting and the hysteria was, now, who wants to give that up? I mean, really, you want to give up the mob, the masses, the crowds, the cheering and the clapping and the hysteria? Because they will buy your book. <laughs> they will buy your book. But it's strange that you know, so many people would then say the Bible is a beloved book. It's a, the Word of God. It's authoritative. It's the rule of faith and practice. Not really. It's in the room when the show goes on. But it's not always in the hearts of the people who are in the room. So talkers are really popular. And the less they know, I think uh, I think Joel Osteen's the first televangelist type preacher I've ever heard say, and almost proudly say, how little he knew of the Bible. And I, I didn't know how that was commendable. Uh, I didn't know how he could be that far removed with a father who had been a pastor and how he could be that far removed from the value of the Bible. But uh, it does get in the way, and you really will find people disappointed in truth. And the truth is a person for us, and uh, he was communicated. The scriptures are our means of communicating and understanding. Uh, but it says the talker's content is quietly passed along over a period of years by word of mouth or popular media. Uh, which is what I was just referencing. Groupy school meetings fueled by peer group pressure. Um, this um, is kind of cultic. It's a private one purpose organization. For example, those one purpose organizations, uh, you'll see people build entire uh, buildings or schools or wings onto universities that are just one purpose to tout something that's been said so often that we've amassed so much response from it. For example, how many books, fiction novels, Left Behind series 
would have to be sold for them to become the truth. Well, we now know that number. <laughs> for some people, they'll pretend to break fellowship over the left behind fiction novel series. Well, the pretense is not that they're breaking fellowship over that. The pretense is that that's the reason. The truth is, is that they don't want fellowship with someone who documents the text. And I certainly don't even, I remember the first time people asked me about rapture. I told them I hadn't studied it. So for a person who really wanted to know, I went and looked and just started out and found out no such noun occurs in the Bible. And then found out it was a verb, found out it then had an adverb simultaneous. And I found out then there's no such thing in the Bible. Now, I don't mean between the ears of talkers, but there's no such thing as a rapture event independent of the resurrection. And there's no such thing as a resurrection independent of the return of Christ. So as all the old scholars once taught from the scripts years and years and years ago, as even confessions bear out, you can read them, they don't mention anything that we hear today. Um, but it was all one event when Christ returned uh, the dead elect in Christ will be raised first and foremost. Then we which are alive, the living ones, the ones remaining around, will be simultaneously seized away together with them, the dead elect. So we, the living elect in Christ, will be seized away simultaneously. So in just one scripture, uh, it makes it untenable, the premise today that there are two events and Someone was so emotionally driven by it, they uh, were telling me very adamantly that, well, you need to know when you're reading the Bible when it's talking about the return and when it's talking about the rapture. And I just said, what's the determinant for that? As though I, who studied the text, wouldn't know that. <laughs> so uh, it was so embarrassing for the person because they were so uninformed and so uneducated in the scriptures and so ill-trained and it's so bought into, which those seem to be the prerequisites for buying into something. But then he was so deluded and so driven by his, between his ears, imagination, that he was speaking to someone who had studied the Bible more years than he had even pretended to be a believer and was presuming to instruct someone who labors and toils in grammar and context and syntax and etymology. And here he was... And I, I really felt bad for the man. So I went ahead and just told him what the text said. But I, I don't think I'll ever get over the look of disappointment people have, talkers do, when the book they claim to be so wonderful, the Bible, and when someone tells them what it said, they're so disappointed. That is compared to their imaginary uh, world. Uh, but this is uh, one purpose organizations and home-based propaganda. These things... Um, for postmodernism, <clears throat> students susceptible to fake agendas are those unwilling to accept fundamental truth, unwilling to understand basic everyday logic, unwilling to read and analyze established literature. For these pseudo thinkers, it is far easier to be into what isn't. And that's, I think, the biggest advantage of getting people to go along, the nothingness of it all. For example, you can. Uh, let's say you have a, a concert, music, just that's a good example, music. Uh, you really don't want a lot of content in your lyrics. Um, you want a few words repeated often, which is okay. It, it, it doesn't mean that's wrong, it just means uh, that's more marketable. And then let's say you have hundreds and hundreds of people gather, then you just turn up the volume, which volume is free, and you fill the air with nothing and if if that's okay because you hope your audience if it's a christian concert that somewhere they're studying the bible somewhere they're knowing more than the four words repeated six times um, but music would be a good example you just won't find very many people working on a, mu a song for contemporary christian radio or whatever that market is say now let's make sure we make this specific enough so that people know that baptismal regeneration is impossible. I don't even know how you begin with those lyrics, you see. Well, it's it's come to the point now where whatever that is in music has now moved into their pulpits and their uh, classrooms and in their fields of knowledge and in their schools. 
which is okay. It's, uh, they would be doing something anyway. That is, they'd be doing nothing anyway otherwise. That is, they would not, if they're not at a concert with Christian lyrics sprinkled in with as little content as possible, and if they weren't in some type of church somewhere that's basically a venue center with no content, um, I mean, they were going to be somewhere. They were going to be at a concert that, like, I remember years and years and years ago, people that uh, claimed to be Christians would uh, trample each other underfoot to call Elvis, a man named Elvis, the king. And so they weren't really that different then. Um, so when you hear people ridicule Christian concerts and all the clamor, uh, some of them were trampling each other underfoot at an Elvis concert. So the nothingness is out there. It's just when it's nothing Christian, it's Christianized nothingness, it becomes difficult to um, reach people that think the less they know, the more uh, they are able to go along. And that's true. If if you really don't know anything about the text, people would like to hear what you have to say. Matter of fact, uh, preachers don't really even look for Bible experts to speak because what would it do for him? And how do you find someone by saying, now look, this is kind of our tradition, this is kind of our talk, this is kind of what we're into, or the no thing that we're into now, so could you come and speak the Bible in such a way that it doesn't cast light onto the nothingness we're into. It's hard to find people like that. So uh, the more you study, like I said, you, you might find yourself out there with just Jesus following him through a cornfield. So uh, be ready for that. Uh, but it says the, they don't like this uh, logic, and I can understand that. Uh, blindly believing whatever peer leaders or zealots or mystics mindlessly decree. Uh, regardless of proof, logic, or common sense. Internet websites, and let me hurry up here, they all propagate and, and endeavor to perpetuate personal belief and unproven assertions as unquestioned, unquestionable fact. I mean, it's so important for it to be the fact that they don't research the facts that can be known, but they publish and broadcast and give all their energy to projecting factual images of unfactual uh, realities. Talkers make decisions in spite of, that is in spite of, rather than in light of fact. And talkers know, tell enough people the same lie enough times, and in time some will believe it. I think Hitler used to practice that. Uh, that'll be a good place to stop. Um, and then the third part will be on functional fixity, and It'll be interesting, but one thing I enjoy about IamCornet.org is no one's written back a text for us um, to defend, that is to document, you know, to define, document, and defend uh, all their emotions. Um, but this is a format that gives people a chance to sit down and listen to it. Some will become emotional and turn it off, which we really don't know, except that's what we expect. And if you don't really like and prefer the text that is for us, uh, the text is our wine, and the talk is just, well, it's not even water for us. Uh, talk won't even quench your thirst. Uh, so that's enough for uh, this broadcast of Text or Talk Part 2.